In this section, we'll look at how you make good decisions about how to control the flow of data through your application to make the best use of a device's resources. To get the best performance out of a tile-based renderer, one of the most important things to get right is the frame graph. This defines the bare bones of the frame, the render passes, the compute passes, and how the data flows between them. To get the best performance out of tile-based hardware, it is critical to ensure that the data flow makes the best use of on-chip tile memory, minimizes the use of external DRAM accesses, and ensures that the vertex and fragment processing can be well parallelized without any scheduling bubbles. For Vulkan, it is also important to ensure the optimal interaction with the display subsystem. Otherwise, you may find the GPU is getting used for composition tasks. If you get this skeleton wrong, you throw away performance and memory bandwidth that you can't easily recover later. Render passes are the main building block for tile-based rendering. During fragment shading, for each tile, the tile buffer is initialized to the starting state of the render pass, shaded locally, and then written back into memory reflecting the state at the end of the render pass. The purpose of this design is to keep high bandwidth accesses inside the local tile buffer, minimizing the traffic between the GPU and the external DRAM. What stays inside the local tile buffer during the render passes need never hit main memory unless it's persisted between render passes. For example, multi-sampled frame buffers can be resolved as part of the tile writeback, so only the resolved data incurs any bandwidth overhead. The raw multi-sample data is simply discarded. The Vulkan API has explicit render passes built into the API. So, we'll start with Vulkan as it's easier to explain. Each render pass is declared as an explicit load op, store op, and resolve op for each attachment. The load op defines what happens at the start of the render pass. A load at this point will fetch the existing content of the attachment from main memory. For Molly, a clear or a don't care will both initialize the tile to the current application clear color, avoiding any memory traffic. Always use load op clear, not a command based clear, for start of pass clears, and load op initialization is more efficient. The store op defines what happens to each attachment at the end of the render pass. A store at this point will write the content back to memory, and a don't care will simply discard the content. The resolve op defines how multi sample attachment resolve is handled. If you are using multi sampling, it is critical to resolve attachments in a single sample before writing them back to memory. Storing all those samples is a high bandwidth consumer, so always use a resolve op on the render pass, not a command based resolve. For this scenario, also remember to set the store op on the multi sampled attachments to don't care. OpenGL ES follows much of the same guidance in principle, but as the API has no explicit concept of render passes, the implementation differs. Render passes in OpenGL ES are entirely built on the fly by the graphics driver based on the API calls made by the application. In general, calling GL bind frame buffer to change the draw target, or calling EGL swap buffers to end a frame, will convert the currently queued commands into a render pass and start a new one. Other API calls can also cause a similar flush behavior. Most obviously, changing the attachment bindings of the current draw target, calling GL flush, GL finish, or EGL make current can all cause the current queued commands to get converted into a render pass. Less obvious are some of the scheduling related behaviors. Waiting on queries and fences in queued in the current command stream will cause a render pass to get created so that the queries and fences can be resolved. In cases where render pass is created, continuing to draw to the surface will result in what we call an incremental render. The future draw calls apply on top of what is already in memory. So the second render pass must effectively do a load op load to populate tile memory with data. This is an expensive operation, so aim to minimize render pass splits. For OpenGLES, the Molly drivers use the frame buffer object as a container to track some optimization state. To keep these optimizations enabled as much as possible, we recommend treating the FBO state immutable once created. Also, if you're using packed D24 S8 textures, always attach both to the frame buffer object as this works best with our AFBC frame buffer compression. The required behavior for OpenGLS is the same as Vulkan. There is no explicit load op, but the first command in a render pass, after the GL bind frame buffer, and before any draw calls, should be a clear, clear buffer, or invalidate if you want Molly to use the fast path tile initialization. A clear after the first draw will be the equivalent of a VK CMD clear, which is slower and more expensive. 
If the last operation on an attachment in a render pass, after the last draw call before changing binding to a new frame buffer, is an invalidate, then the data will be discarded and not written back into memory at all. For multi-sampled attachments, ensure you use the ext multi sampled render to texture extension to benefit from the inline sample resolves. Avoid glblit frame buffer for multi-sampling resolves, as it means the multi sampled data has to round trip via DRAM. One of the most powerful techniques for diagnosing render pass inefficiencies is to draw the frame graph, showing the render passes and the data flow between them. In this diagram, the large gray boxes are render passes, the small white boxes are attachments, and the lines show data flow. Solid lines indicate use as an attachment, whereas dotted lines indicate consumption as a texture. The basic technique for drawing a frame graph is relatively simple. Treat each render pass as a box, with input and output sockets for each attachment. Each input socket must be cleared or invalidated to avoid a load from memory, and each output socket must be invalidated to avoid a store to memory. When drawing these graphs, remember to include all the render pass-like structures in the API, such as compute dispatches, copies, and blitz. They all use the same GPU, and their data must also flow through the DRAM, so it's worth getting them into the visualization. Here, we have a simple example of the frame graph, showing the data flow between five render passes. The main rendering part of the graph uses a shadow map, and then two passes for lighting, one for opaque objects, and one for transparent objects that are laid on top. A motion blur is applied over the top, using a velocity map to blur the results of the main rendering in the final post-processing step. The highlighted attachments in this step have no input, and so should be cleared or invalidated as the first operation in the pass. This avoids unnecessary readbacks from DRAM at the start of each pass. The highlighted attachments in this step have no downstream consumer, and so should be invalidated as the last operation in the pass. This avoids unnecessary writes to DRAM at the end of each pass. In this example, we can see a direct feed through a case where the output attachments of one pass are read as an input attachment of a later pass without any intervening use as a texture. These can be merged into a single render pass, avoiding the split in the middle. In this example, we can see an extract from a real frame graph. The first problem that we see here is a rendering pass that literally has no consumers. The entire pass can be optimized away by the application rendering engine. The second problem that we can see is a depth attachment that has no consumers. The third problem that we can see is partial feed through, where we can see render pass 3 directly consuming many of the outputs of render pass 2 as input attachments. It's not a complete feed through. Two color attachments generated by render pass 2 are not used by render pass 3, but it's still possible to merge them into a single pass and use GL draw buffers to skip writes to the unused attachments during the second pass. Finally, we have a sequence of another three render passes using feed through attachments. These can be merged into a single render pass. Each of the lines here represents reading a 1080p image in memory, so optimizing these out can save a considerable amount of bandwidth. AFBC is ARM's proprietary lossless frame buffer compression, which typically gives between 30 and 50% compression, depending on the image. Like most lossless frame buffer compression schemes, it is transparent to the application. It is enabled automatically by the drivers when it is possible to do so. On current hardware, only 32-bit per pixel formats are compressed, and on the Bifrost family hardware, there is no floating point compression at all. There is also no compression for unresolved MSAA data, so be sure to resolve a single sample on tile writeback. In addition, AFBC is not supported for image load or store in shaders. These will perform uncompressed reads and writes, requiring a decompression pass on first use if the image is compressed. For Vulkan, use of AFBC is determined statically based on the image flags used when the image view is created. To use AFBC, images must use image tiling optimal memory layout, and must not use image usage storage, image usage transient, or image create alias. Tile memory for color data needs to be able to store all the color attachments concurrently, when factoring the number of attachments, the number of samples, and their color format. Using more than 256 bits per pixel on a modern MOLLE will result in the tile size dropping, which will incur efficiency overheads. This is rarely a problem in practice, but beware of using multi-sampling with MRT attachments.
Compute shaders provide a means to use the shader core as a general purpose parallel processing engine. But note this comes with a loss of functionality compared to the fixed function pipeline. Use compute where there are some significant algorithmic optimizations for doing so, such as the ability to armoritize work and output multiple pixels for compute. Naive replacement of fragment shaders with compute shaders will normally result in a net loss of performance, as dedicated accelerators such as varying interpolators and frame buffer compression are not accessible. As noted earlier, using images can be less efficient than textures. Only use image load slash store for cases where you need the ability to write image data. For read-only access, use the texture operations. Tile-based rendering runs a deep pipeline, overlapping vertex and fragment processing from different render passes to keep the GPU hardware busy. Maintaining this pipeline with good overlap and minimal scheduling bubbles is of critical importance for rendering efficiency. For OpenGL ES, the majority of the dependency management is handled by the driver. So, the main things to watch out for are API calls that can cause a full pipeline drain, where the driver or one of the hardware queues must block and wait for another part of the system to catch up. GL finish, GL memory barrier, and synchronous GL read pixels are all good examples of things that can stall the pipeline. The other thing to remember is that work takes a long time to process. Getting work through this pipeline may have a latency of equal to one frame of rendering, so don't try to touch resources on the CPU too soon after using them in a command. Aim to wait at least one frame, preferably two, before waiting on fences or reading query results. In Vulkan, managing execution dependencies between GPU commands is the responsibility of the application. These dependencies need to be strict enough to ensure correct rendering, but not so strict that they prevent parallelism. Set dependency SRC stage to be as early in the pipeline as possible, and set dependency DST stage to be as late in the pipeline as possible. If you are struggling to get two passes to overlap, consider issuing a completely unrelated stage between two dependent stages, which will allow more time for the first stage to complete. Beware of the temptation of the easy option. Setting SRC stage to bottom of pipe and DST stage to top of pipe is safe, but it serializes all of the GPU execution and prevents all overlap between passes. Compute shaders execute in the same hardware queue as geometry process, so be aware of compute shaders causing bubbles in scheduling. If consuming the output of a compute shader in a fragment shader, aim to run some non-dependent work before the fragment shader to keep the GPU cores busy. Transfer operations are commonly needed for discrete GPUs to migrate resources between system RAM and graphics RAM. For mobile platforms, based on unified memory, they are needed less often. So, aim to avoid them where possible, as they are a waste of bandwidth. For Vulkan, the application sets the swap chain behavior. Double buffering, using two images in the swap chain, gives the lowest input latency for gaming, but as most mobile devices run with vSync enabled, it can also limit frame rate if the application is missing vSync deadlines. The observed frame rate will snap to an integer division of the panel refresh rate, 60, 30, 20, 15, and so on. For best throughput, the higher latency, run with three images in the swap chain. This is called triple buffering and allows the GPU to continue processing while waiting for the display to scan out an image. One challenge with double buffering is that you won't observe any improvement until you get the frames per second over the next threshold. So, optimizations won't seem to be helping the observed frame rate. Even if you plan to ship the title using double buffering to reduce input latency, we recommend using triple buffering during profiling work so that everyone sees the true frame rate that is being achieved. Mobile devices can be rotated, with the application view typically rotating to match the logical orientation of the device, rather than the physical orientation of the panel. It is critically important for display controller efficiency that the orientation of the frame buffer in memory matches the physical scanout orientation of the panel. Passing in a buffer in the wrong orientation may incur additional background processing, using either a dedicated composition engine or the GPU itself, which will eat into your game's power budget. For OpenGL ES, this is all negotiated transparently by the driver. But, for Vulkan, the application developer has to handle the panel rotation events. Every frame, use the pre-transform hint in the swap chain and ensure that your swap chain output images match the panel orientation.
In the next video, we will introduce some engine and API best practices to help you avoid common problems.